It is June, and with June comes Pride Month, a time to celebrate and commemorate lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride. So today, we're discussing Chicago's Pride events history. I'm Tommy Henry, and this is the Chicago History Podcast. For this episode, I'm joined by Mike McMains. Mike runs Tours with Mike, a Chicago tour operation with a goal of making architecture, design, and history fun and interesting. Tours with Mike has received a ton of press from outlets such as Block Club Chicago, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, Daytime Chicago, Fox 32, WBEZ Radio, WGN-TV, and Radio, and many more. WTTW's Jeffrey Bear said of McMaines, he is a tour guide's tour guide. And the Chicago Tribune called his ugly buildings tour the local architecture tour that needed to happen. In addition to his ugly buildings walking tour, he has an underground Chicago tour plus rats, one focused on incredible interiors, architecture's greatest hits, play ball, the Wrigleyville tour. And this month, he introduced three LGBTQ stories tours, one for downtown, one for the north side, and a bus tour on Chicago's south side. Mike, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Tommy. So you've got probably the busiest of busy tours in June. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, so uh, I'm really excited to have these offerings. One of the big advantages of having a solo tour company is that I'm very nimble and I can create experiences that I'm excited about. And I didn't really see these stories being shared. So I have three different ones focused on LGBTQ stories. And I wanted to highlight that these stories are happening all over the city, not just on North Halstead and Boys Town, which we'll be talking about in a bit, but it's also through downtown and Chicago South Side. So I'm really excited to talk about these very influential cultural leaders and activists and major events and how it's shaped not just the city, but the entire world. Before we talk about Chicago's Pride Week and the Pride Parade, we need to touch briefly on the history of LGBTQ acceptance and rights in Chicago. Many of Chicago's earliest establishments catering to people today called LGBTQ were in the vice districts, especially the South Side Levy districts. These bars and taverns weren't necessarily seen as progressive, but in true Chicago form, they were open to making money off people regardless of their persuasions. In the mid-1800s, morality campaigns were becoming prevalent nationwide. In 1851, the City Council of Chicago put in place several laws that would punish any, quote, offense against public morals and decency, end quote. Some of these rules seem pretty straightforward, like the ones prohibiting gambling and public nudity. Some, like the one prohibiting swimming in the river, not so much. One of the ordinances targeted those who, quote, appeared in a dress not belonging to his or her sex or in an indecent or lewd dress, thus making Chicago one of the first cities with a ban on cross-dressing. The fine for this infraction was to be not less than $20 nor exceeding $100. In today's value, that's nearly $800 on the low end to almost $4,000 on the high end. This was far above the usual fine of $5, or about $200 in today's money. According to Gender Crossroads, Representations of Gender Transgressions in Chicago's Press, 1850 to 1920, written by Jennifer Breyer and Ann Parsons in Out in Chicago, LGBT History in the Crossroads, the Chicago Tribune reported hundreds of cases involving gender crossing. Those picking up the daily paper were able to read about men and male-bodied people who dressed and or lived as women, and female-bodied people who dressed and or lived as men. Many of the stories were presented as almost accidental in nature. Someone gets hurt, is taken to the hospital, where the staff discovers something other than they anticipated once the patient was undressed for examination. Later, the stories began to take on a more curious nature, almost a scientific approach. A key figure in Chicago's early LGBTQ activism is Henry Gerber, born Henry Joseph Dittmar on June 29, 1892 in Bavaria. He changed his name to Henry Gerber after immigrating to the United States, where his family settled in one of Chicago's many German-speaking areas. 
1917, Gerber was briefly committed to a mental institution because of his homosexuality. In 1924, Gerber was living at 1710 North Crilly Court in the Old Town Triangle area, not far from Lincoln Park and the Chicago History Museum. At the time, he was working for the post office. It was here on Crilly Court that Gerber founded the Society for Human Rights, an organization that advocated for the civil rights of homosexuals and is considered the first gay rights society in the United States. Henry Gerber wrote the organization's mission statement and, with the help of a lawyer, filed for its incorporation, listing the address on Crilly Court as its headquarters. The corporation was granted by the city of Chicago in December of 1924. Members of the Society for Human Rights held meetings and lectures on Crilly Court and even published a newsletter called Friendship and Freedom, all in the quest of furthering the discussion about LGBT people it is thought that the Society for Human Rights never had more than 10 members. Unfortunately, the general public's hostility concerning homosexuality at the time was strong, and police raided one of the Society members' apartments after his wife reported his involvement in the group. Police then conducted a 2 a.m. raid at Gerber's new residence at 34 Oak Street, confiscating his newsletters, diaries, and even his typewriter. The attention by the authorities caused the group to disband in July 1925, fewer than eight months after it was incorporated, after publishing only two newsletters. No copies of the newsletters are known to exist. Instead of fighting the case against him, Gerber paid an influential lawyer $200, nearly $3,500 in today's money, to fix the state attorney and judges, Gerber would later claim in a 1962 article for a Los Angeles-based gay publication. It worked as the judge dismissed the case based on the lack of search warrant by the police. While Gerber's typewriter was returned to him, his diaries were given to his supervisors at the post office, who fired him for, quote, conduct unbecoming a postal worker. Gerber left Chicago shortly after this, never to return. He continued advocating for gay rights until his death in 1972 at the age of 80. In 2015, Gerber's home on Crilly Court became the country's second LGBTQ site to receive a National Historic Landmark designation, following only New York's Stonewall Inn. More on that in a moment. Earlier, we mentioned the 1851 law against citizens wearing clothing not belonging to their sex. This was challenged in the years that followed, notably in 1943, when Evelyn Jackie Bross and Catherine Barsk were arrested and brought to the Racine Avenue police station. 19-year-old Bross, who lived on the city's west side, and Barsk, 23, both worked as drill press operators at a World War II defense plant. Bross was arrested by police on her way home from work for dressing as a man. At the women's court, Bross explained to the judge that she wore men's clothing because it was, quote, more comfortable than women's clothes and handy for work. Their employer, Paul Crone, testified they were exceptional workers, and Bross's mother told the judge that her daughter had worn slacks since the age of 13. The judge ordered Bross to see a court psychiatrist for six months and suspended the fines of $200 each for Bross and Bars. Barsky agreed to return to her husband, and the two women were allowed to remain at their present employer, provided they did not associate with each other. Prominent women in the fashion world, industry, society, and volunteer war work took up Bross's cause, saying that women's suffrage and slacks ought to go hand in hand. Alderman William J. Cowhey of the 41st Ward agreed and proposed an amendment to the city ordinance as a direct result of this case. The Chicago City Council soon amended the 1851 ordinance to exclude those people who did not intend to use clothing to conceal their sex. The Chicago police practice of arresting those wearing clothing the cops felt did not match their gender persisted through the rest of the post-World War II period, with the ordinance against cross-dressing finally repealed in 1973. Going back to 1962, Illinois became the first state in the country to repeal its sodomy laws, which decriminalized homosexuality. As a result, a huge influx of LGBTQ people, predominantly from the Midwest, moved to Chicago because they thought life would be easier, and a bunch of new gay and lesbian bars opened up. 
The end of Illinois sodomy laws unfortunately did not bring an end to police routinely harassing Chicago's LGBTQ population. Police commonly raided gay and lesbian bars that did not pay them off in bribes, and sometimes even if they did, they would arrest bar workers and patrons on frivolous charges like disorderly conduct. After spending the night in jail, they would be let go and no formal charges would be pressed. It was common that Chicago police raided four or five gay and lesbian bars like this each evening. In a particularly notorious example, Lewis's Fun Lounge was raided in 1964 with officers arresting 109 LGBTQ people there. Sheriff Richard Ogilvy led the raid and said what was happening at the bar was, quote, too revolting to describe in detail in public. Even though criminal charges were eventually dropped against everyone arrested, their names, professions, and addresses were featured in front page exposés in the city's newspapers, like the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Sun-Times. This conviction by publicity resulted in these LGBTQ people getting fired from their jobs, abandonment by their friends and families, and even committing suicide. Ogilvy leveraged raids like this one into a tough-on-crime image and was elected Illinois' governor in 1968. This kind of police harassment of people at gay and lesbian bars was happening all over the country. And in 1969, LGBTQ people fought back in New York's Stonewall Uprising. In the immediate aftermath, LGBTQ activists in many cities around the country began organizing. These national efforts culminated with gay liberation marches commemorating the first anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising on June 28, 1970. Chicago got a jump on everyone by holding the first march nationally the day before. On Saturday, June 27, 1970, the Chicago Gay Liberation Movement organized speeches and dancing in Washington Square Park. The location at which the event was held is as noteworthy as the event itself. Franklin Rosemont wrote of Washington Square in the Encyclopedia of Chicago, Bug House Square, from Bug House slang for mental health facilities, is the popular name for Chicago's Washington Square Park, where orators, or soapboxers, held forth on warm weather evenings from the 1910s through the mid-1960s. Located across Walton Street from the Newberry Library, Bug House Square was the most celebrated outdoor free speech center in the nation and a popular Chicago tourist attraction. In its heyday during the 1920s and 1930s, poets, religionists, and cranks addressed the crowds, but the mainstays were soapboxers from the revolutionary left, especially the industrial workers of the world, the IWW, the Proletarian Party, Revolutionary Workers League, and more ephemeral groups. The bohemian live and let live mentality of the area surrounding Bug House Square made it a popular place for Chicago's LGBTQ population at the time. After listening to speeches at Bug House Square, the roughly 150 participants without a city sanctioned parade permit bravely went forward with the country's first gay liberation march down Chicago Avenue to Michigan Avenue and the historic Water Tower Place, then to Randolph Street for more speeches at Daly Plaza. The day's activities ended with a chain dance around the Picasso statue as those participating chanted, Gay Power to Gay People. According to an article from the Associated Press, one day later, on Sunday, July 28, 1970, approximately 3,000 people, members of homosexual and freedom groups from the Northeast, marched from New York City's Greenwich Village to a Central Park Gay Inn, the conclusion to the city's Gay Pride Week. Michael Brown, 29, one of the founders of the Gay Liberation Front in New York, was quoted as saying, We'll never have the freedom and civil rights we deserve as human beings unless we stop hiding in closets and in the shelter of anonymity. The march is an affirmation and declaration of our new pride. On the same day, on the other side of the country, police estimated 400 people marched down Hollywood Boulevard alongside a makeshift float and python. That event sponsor said upwards of 1,200 supporters participated in the mile-long parade. The West Coast Parade was sponsored by a group called Christopher Street West, named after the street on which the Stonewall Clash occurred in New York City that year before. 
Variations of the same news report contain headlines such as homosexuals hold parade from the news press from Fort Myers, Florida. In that one, the writer explained gay is the word homosexuals use to describe themselves and that, quote, light in spirit and marked by much cavorting and prancing, the march and rally were devoid of incident, end quote. Days later, at a 4th of July parade in Provincetown, Massachusetts, 150 members of the Gay Liberation Front marched a few feet behind the traditional Independence Day parade through that city's downtown area. Throughout the early years of the Pride Parades, attendance hovered at roughly 3,000 watchers per year here in Chicago, jumping to approximately 10,000 by 1978. By the early 1980s, it was nearly 30,000. While campaigning for mayor in February of 1983, Mayor Jane Byrne was asked at a meeting of the Greater Chicago Gay and Lesbian Democrats if she would join the Pride Parade that year. Byrne answered in the affirmative, causing the audience to respond with what the Chicago Tribune called a, quote, raucous ovation. The crowd began shouting, we want Jane, and four more years. In front of the crowd of roughly 400 people at St. Sebastian School at 810 West Wellington, Byrne said, quote, I will go on fighting, not only for all Chicago, but for all types of Chicagoans. While all three major Democratic mayoral contenders were invited to speak, only Byrne showed. Al Raby, the campaign manager for Harold Washington, spoke on behalf of his candidate, and State Senator Don Clark Netch attended on behalf of State Attorney Richard Daley. After the speeches, the group voted 90 to 19 to endorse Byrne for mayor, Byrne went on to lose that election to Washington. To Byrne's credit, in June of that year, the former mayor fulfilled her campaign promise by leading Chicago's 14th Pride Parade, sitting on the back of a convertible Mustang with an estimated 30,000 people watching along the parade route. Mayor Held Washington was in California that weekend and was not present. Three city aldermen also marched in the parade, according to the reports. The 100-degree heat did not dampen the spirits of those in attendance. Gays are standing up and fighting for their rights. Parade spokesman Richard Pfeiffer was quoted as saying, Politicians are realizing that the gay community has a large voting block. They are counting our votes. End quote. According to a news report, one parade participant, a loop attorney named Ron Eamon, said the parade was important in showing young homosexuals the wide range of options available to them. Quote, I think it's very important for the professional gays to be visible, said Eamon. Young people are losing sight of their goals. They need to be inspired that they are capable as gays and professionals to fit into the community. Jane Byrne was back the following year as 5,000 marchers made their way down Clark Street, watched by an estimated 30,000 people. Then state's attorney Richard M. Daly sent his lawmobile to be part of the parade. I have no idea what Daly's lawmobile was, but it sounds amazing. Although he never marched in the pride parade, Mayor Harold Washington, the city's first African-American mayor, headlined a Lincoln Park rally in July 1984 that called for a reintroduction of a sexual orientation non-discrimination ordinance that activists and supportive city council members had been trying to enact since 1973. According to the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame, which inducted Washington posthumously in 2007, it was this rally that sparked a renewed campaign by LGBT activists to get the ordinance passed. To highlight his effort, Washington spoke at the annual rally following the Pride Parade in every subsequent year that he served in office. The ordinance, unofficially but widely known as the Human Rights Ordinance, was finally enacted in 1988 and stands as a testament to Washington's vision of equal rights for all Chicagoans. 1989 saw a first for the city when Richard M. Daley became the first Chicago mayor to participate in the annual Gay and Lesbian Pride Parade held June 25th of that year. Uh, Tommy, wait, I thought you said Jane Byrne was the first mayor to participate in the parade. See, I, I had to look this up as well because it was confusing. Although Jane Byrne rode in the parade after she was no longer mayor and Harold Washington spoke at post-parade events, 
Richard M. Daley was the first mayor to ride in the parade while in office. Uh, he rode in a shiny 1956 aqua-colored Thunderbird convertible for his ride near the front of the parade. Daly told reporters, quote, I think the parade means a lot to the gay and lesbian community, and it means a lot to Chicago. It shows a community spirit, end quote. Mayor Daley reportedly received cheers from many of the thousands of those who lined up along the two-mile route on the north side. Chicago is also home to the Gerber Hart Library and Archives in the Rogers Park neighborhood, named for the previously discussed Henry Gerber and Pearl M. Hart, an attorney who fought for the rights of gays and lesbians. According to the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame, which inducted Hart posthumously in 1992, Hart was the first woman lawyer to be appointed as public defender in the Morals Court and maintained an acquittal record of over 90%. A consistent feminist, she and her two associates made their libraries, advice, and quiet study room available to women law students. Throughout her life, Pearl Hart defended gay rights, appearing on behalf of many victims of entrapment and harassment, often without charging clients or for a minimal fee. She worked for anti-entrapment laws and the right to privacy. For all of Pearl Hart's accomplishments, two of her goals were never achieved, to be elected to the City Council of Chicago and to be appointed as a judge. She was considered too liberal and too honest to win the backing of a corrupt political system. Hart's campaign for a City Council seat was conducted by Studs Terkel, a longtime friend and fellow fighter for social justice. The Gerber Hart Library and Archives is the largest circulating library of gay and lesbian titles in the Midwestern United States and houses more than 14,000 volumes, 800 periodical titles, and 100 archival collections. President Bill Clinton first designated June as Gay and Lesbian Pride Month on June 11, 1999. Ten years later, former Illinois Senator and then President Barack Obama proclaimed June as Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Pride Month. Chicago's Pride Fest and Pride Parade have each grown dramatically over the years. While the Pride Fest held the weekend before the Pride Parade is expected to draw a crowd of 60,000 people to the North Halsted neighborhood in 2023, the Pride Parade routinely draws well over one million people to celebrate Chicago's vibrant LGBTQ community. Of course, Chicago's Pride events don't stop at the fest and parade. Recently, the Shed Aquarium hosted a memorable Pride night at Shed, featuring multiple DJs and an ocean-themed drag showcase. According to the press release, guests were invited to, quote, discover the wonders of the aquatic animal world in an environment that welcomes and embraces all identities and the opportunity to convene together to embrace the diversity of our community. Anyone following the news is likely aware that the rights of the LGBT community are under attack. As of this writing, the American Civil Liberties Union is currently tracking 491 anti-LGBTQ bills in the US. Most of these bills are specifically targeting transgender people's bodily autonomy access to medical care, where they feel comfortable using the restroom, and how they present themselves in public. While many states, including Illinois, California, New York, and Wisconsin reflect zero bills pending, many states, like Florida and Tennessee, are making LGBTQ discrimination a new part of their state law. Amongst June's Pride Month celebrations in Chicago and across the country, there is a renewed urgency to fight for LGBTQ equality. Thanks for listening to today's episode about Chicago's Pride events history. This episode was researched and written by me, Tommy Henry. And me, Mike McMains. If you want to help out the podcast, please like, rate, and review the podcast and tell a friend. It helps us get the word out to fans of Chicago history. There are links to books and other items related to Chicago's LGBTQ history in the show's notes. If you or someone you know is a history nerd like us who would like to learn more, 
Anything ordered through those links, not just the items listed, may earn a small commission for the podcast and help offset production costs at no cost to you. Check out the Chicago History Podcast Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages for articles and pictures related to this episode and past episodes posted throughout the week. The original art for the Chicago History Podcast used on the social media pages was created by John K. Schneider. You are the best, Johnny. He can be found at Angel Eyes Art JKS on Instagram or via email at angeleyesartjks at gmail.com. I will be back soon with more stories from Chicago's history. Until then, get out and explore when possible. Go on a tours with bike tour. Learn more about whatever city you live in and stay safe.